The Science of Prime Numbers, written and read by Raymond Simpson, me! Chapter 1. What is a prime number? As shown in my book, I have made a pattern of numbers. Each of those numbers happens to be a prime number, which is a whole number greater than one that is divisible by exactly two numbers, itself a one. Put another way, a prime number can have only two factors. So, seven is a prime number because he has only two factors, one and seven. Okay, I challenge you to find a number other than one or seven that divides evenly into it. I can't. Thought so. Okay, based on our definition, one can't be a prime number since it's only divisible by one number, one. And a number like eight is also not prime because it's divisible by two numbers. One, eight, two, and four. Numbers that can be divided by more than two numbers are called composite numbers. Chapter two, the history of primes. The fact is, prime numbers have fascinated human civilization for as long as people have been studying math. We're pretty sure the ancient Egyptians knew about prime numbers. Though the ancient Greeks were probably the first to really study them. The famous Greek mathematician Euclid wrote an entire book on the subject. He wrote about some of the most useful properties of prime numbers. Well, one of them was called the Fundamental Theorem of Arithmetic. Here's what it says. Every whole number greater than one that isn't a prime number is actually the product of prime numbers. In other words, by multiplying different sets of prime numbers together, you can come up with any non-prime number, no matter how big or small. That's one of the reasons why mathematicians continue to study primes. They're like the building blocks of all numbers. Breaking any number down into its prime elements is a process called prime factorization. Euclid also proved that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Trust me, they just keep going. Now, you might be asking yourself how we came up with all those numbers. There's actually a pretty simple way to identify all the prime numbers up to a certain point, and it's called the sieve of Eratosthenes. Chapter 3. Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes was another ancient Greek mathematician who lived about the same time as Euclid, and his method of sorting composite numbers from prime numbers is sort of like draining water from pasta. Step 1. First, we make a chart of every number from 1 to, say, 100. Step 2. Since 1 isn't a prime, cross him out. Step 3. Then, circle 2, and the smallest prime, and cross out every even number after 2. Since they're all divisible by 2, they're not prime. In other words, 2 is the only even prime number. All the other prime numbers are odd. Step 4, then circle 3 and cross out every third number. Step 5, now circle 5 and cross out every fifth number. Step 6, keep going until every number has either been circled or crossed out and you've basically drained out all the composite numbers, leaving just the prime numbers behind. Of course, this only works up to a certain point. With bigger numbers, you eventually run out of space to write. Chapter 4. The Biggest Primes The biggest prime numbers, numbers with millions of digits, can only be found using computers. These numbers are so large, it often takes hundreds of computers and years and years to find them. As of early 2019, 
The largest known prime number is over 25 million digits long. There are an infinite number of primes, of course, so mathematicians are always looking to raise the bar. There are even big cash prizes which go to anyone who discovers the next biggest prime number. Chapter 5. Electroprimes.net Every time somebody does something on the internet, their data is encrypted by prime numbers. It's basically a kind of code. For every code, there's a key. It can be very hard to find the key to the code, and once you find it, you soon discover that the code is made of prime numbers. Big prime numbers! Chapter 6. Prime Factors Prime factors are the prime numbers which multiply together to make the number. They are the same as prime numbers, which look like this. Now you might be thinking, these prime numbers are so spooky. It's like they pop up when you least expect. Well, like I said earlier, the only even prime number is two. The rest are off. So that narrows it down. But you're right. They are hard to find because not every odd number is a prime number. And it can take a long time to work out the factors of a large number, which means that the bigger the number is, the longer it can take to work out if it's a prime. The only time table these numbers appear in is their own. If only there was some kind of pattern you could find. If only you could predict where you might find them. Chapter 7. 1. As mentioned earlier, a prime number is a number that can only be divided by one of itself. So the prime numbers are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, you know these numbers. So it sounds like 1 should be a prime number, right? After all, it fits the definition of the prime number. It's divided by, you can divide by 1, and you can divide it by itself, which is 1. And historically, it was considered a prime number. So if you're thinking, hmm, it sounds like it should be, well, that's what they used to think. That's what mathematicians used to think as well. But in the end, they had to exclude him from the prime numbers. Oh, poor old one. One is the loneliest number. The loneliest number you'll ever do. So it's excluded because of a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. I told you about that theorem in five chapters ago. Now it says that every positive whole number, or integer if you like, can be written as a unique product of primes. So what this means is that prime numbers are like our atoms, like atoms in chemistry. Now, look at this word, unique. Now, he's not just there for decoration. It's a really important word. He means that there's only one way to do it. Let's take the number 15. 15 is essentially 3 times 5. 3 and 5 are prime. Now 15 is also 5 times 3. And we don't mind that, that's a laugh. What we don't like is that 15 is 1 times 3 times 5. Or 1 times 1 times 3 times 5. And it's also 1 times 1 times 1 times 3 times 5. If 1 was a prime, then we would not have a unique way of writing 15 as a product of primes. So what this meant was that when they used to think that 1 was a prime, they had to keep excluding 1 from your theorems. They used to say, take every prime number except for 1. And we just got tired of doing that, so we decided to exclude one from our definition of a prime number. It's a bit like saying, take this list, which is the list of all the prime numbers up to a certain point, and it doesn't have one in it. So one is not a prime number. He isn't considered a composite number, where you make the other numbers from primes. No, he has a category of his own, where he sits all lonely by himself. 
But why does this mean that one's not a prime? Maybe it's just a stupid theorem. Maybe the theorem's no good. Why does the theorem beat number one out? Well, I have a choice to include one in that category if I want to. Away from two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, blah, blah, blah. Looking at the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, doesn't that mean that one isn't a whole number? Because surely one can't be made as a unique product of primes. Well, I'll show you. Let's take, I'll start with 16. Now 16 is the product of four primes. So that's two times two times two times two. Eight is the product of three primes. Four is the product of two primes. Two is the product of one prime. And then if I divide it by two again, I get one, which is the product of no primes. He's called an empty product. So that's four primes, three primes, two primes, one prime, and no primes. And he's not zero, he's one. He's called an empty product. Chapter eight, Mersenne primes. Okay, so in this chapter, we're going to talk about Mersenne numbers. So I have to pick one of my Mersenne numbers to sort of exemplify the category. Now, my fans always make me do this, so I decided to pick 31 because by 2028, my year 6 teacher, Miss Donison, will be 31, so it's a nice personal number for her. So, 31 is our example of a Mersenne prime. So, a Mersenne prime is a prime number to begin with, like 31. 31 is a prime number. A prime number is, as you probably know, a number that can only be divided by one and itself. The first few prime numbers are two, three, five, seven. Thirty-one is a prime number, but she's a special type of prime number because she's one less than a power of two. What are the powers of two? You've got two, uh, you've got four, You've got 8, 16, 32, and so on. Okay, so that's just 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. That's the sort of thing. None of those are prime numbers, but let's have a look at one less. Well, 1. Now, if I'm honest, we don't say 1 is prime. There's a special reason for that. But let's have a look at the others. 3 is a prime number. And she's one less than a power of two, so she counts as a Mersenne prime. Seven is a prime number, and he's one less than a power of two. Fantastic. Fifteen. Now he's not a prime number, so he does not count. And thirty-one, there you go. She was our example of a Mersenne prime. Now, there aren't many of these Mersenne primes. In fact, there's only 47 Mersenne primes. So they start off as 3, 7, 31. The next one after that is 127. So let's have a look at the next couple. The powers of 2, 64, and 128. And, well, this is 63. And he's not prime. But this is 127. She is prime. So she's one of our Mersenne primes. They're called Mersenne primes because they're named after a French mathematician called Marin Mersenne, who was a monk, a mathematician, and a musician, and a fan of alliteration. His favourite cartoon was Mighty Mouse. His favourite film was Mad Max. <laughs> so, he was in contact with a lot of other mathematicians around the world. And he was trying to make a list of his special type of prime number. And that's why they named after him. Are they useful? Are they used by code breakers? Are they used to make better iPads? Or are they just a game for smart mathematicians like you? Well, prime numbers are obviously very useful to mathematicians. They're famous and they're famous for a reason. Mersenne primes are a special type of prime number. 
something very special about Mersenne primes is that they are related to the perfect numbers. I've talked about perfect numbers before. They were 6, 28, 496, 8,128. They were known by the ancient Greeks. They were given this idea that they were perfect, unique. Mersenne primes and perfect numbers are two sides of the same coin. Let me show you why. If I pick a Mersenne prime, let's call it M for Mersenne prime. Okay, so M is our Mersenne prime. Times her by M plus one, divide by two, and that will give you a perfect number. Let me show you. Three times four divided by two. That's 12 divided by two. That's six. That's the first perfect number. Now let's try the next one. Seven. Seven times eight divided by two. That's 56 divided by two. That's 28. That's the second perfect number. 31. Same thing. 31 times 32 divided by two. And that will give you the third perfect number. 496. Now let's try 127. 127 times 128 and halve it. It's 8,128. Two sides of the same coin. Right, so you can help to find the next Mersenne Prime. It's called the Great Internet Mersenne Prime Search. It's a great website with an unfortunate acronym. It's at mersen.org. Download the program. It uses collaborative computer power to find the next Mersen Prime. Why should I do that? Why should anyone do that? For the glory! For the <laughs> glory! Because mathematicians will thank you for it. Like the perfect numbers, we don't know if there's infinitely many perfect numbers. We don't know if there are infinitely many Mersen primes or not. So that's another open question. Something that maybe you could work out. What's it going to take to work that out? How will that question ever be answered? It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be obvious. It's going to require a different way of looking at things. Something we haven't tried yet. Maybe not your usual school math, but something else. Whatever it is, it's something we haven't tried yet. The man or woman who does that, what will it mean for them? If a man or a woman comes up with that proof, what will happen? If you do come up with that proof, you will have glory thrust upon you. You will become famous for coming up with such a proof. Something that has eluded mathematicians for hundreds of years. <clears throat> Is it something you can have a hunch about? Yeah, I think technically we would have to be Mercer and Prime agnostic. But it's definitely something you have a hunch for. Mathematicians is done like they right? People think that mathematics is a dry subject, but it's logical. But people have intuition. They have to pursue their intuition. So if you ask me, yeah, I would say, yeah, infinitely many Mersenne primes. Yeah, I would think so too. I might be wrong. Chapter 9. The last digits of primes. We found a new pattern in the primes, from what we didn't know was there. Primes don't like to repeat their last digits. It's really, really strange. So a prime could end in a one, a three, a seven, or a nine. I mean, the exceptions are to itself, which obviously end in the two of five themselves. But apart from that, they end in one, three, seven, or nine. And um, because we hope that primes are random, if we feel like they kind of appear randomly, but each one of those should be equally likely. And something strange has happened. So some mathematicians in Stanford have looked at this and they've looked at consecutive primes and they've noticed things like if a prime ends in a nine, 
it's actually more likely to for the next prime to end in a one rather than a nine or a three or a seven. So you would expect all of those to be equally likely to turn up next. But when they did it and they looked at the first 100 million primes, when they did that, if you had a prime ending in a nine, the chance that the next prime ended in a nine was 18%, which is not a quarter. And the chance that it ended in a one was greater than a quarter. It was 32%. It shouldn't be. That shouldn't be how it is. But that's what they found out. Let's find out why this is. So if the primes are random, then these prime endings here, 1, 3, 7 and 9, they should each appear about a quarter of the time each. And if we have the consecutive primes and we look at their prime endings, we would have 16 options. You would have a one and a one. So that would be a prime ending in a one followed by a prime ending in a one. It could be a one followed by a three or one followed by a seven or a one followed by a nine. Those are some options. Okay, there are 16 options when you're looking at two consecutive primes. So if it was random, they should all appear one sixteenth of the time each, equally likely of the time. But that's not what they found at all. In particular, the diagonal entries, so the 1, 1, 3, 3, 7, 7, and 9, 9, are the least likely to turn up. So the primes aren't repeating themselves. And there's a few explanations for why this could be the case, which I'm going to dismiss. I'm going to give you a few explanations which aren't the reason why this is happening. So one might be, okay, if you have a prime ending in a 9, then, well, you have to go through all the numbers and before you get to another prime ending in a 9. We just have to go through the numbers ending in a 1 and a 3 and a 7 before you get to another number ending in a 9. It's so further away. Of course it is 9. Unfortunately, that isn't enough to explain the bias that we found. If that's the case, then we're looking for prime gaps less than 10, right? That means you would have the next one less than 10. So you're going for a prime ending in a one next, or the prime ending in a three next. And the prime gaps less than 10 are not that many. And so that's not enough to explain how biased this is. The bias is bigger than that, so that's no good. Another explanation might be, I said that these prime endings 1, 3, 7 and 9, if this was a random thing, they should each appear about a quarter of the time each. Maybe it, the explanation is that that's not true. Maybe the bias comes from the primes themselves and that doesn't work out either. There is a slight bias in the primes. And it's something we know about. It's called Chebyshev's bias. It says that primes ending in 3 and 7 are slightly more likely. That is something that we know about. We know why this happens. And it's such a slight thing. It's not enough. So there is this known bias in prime number endings. So under that assumption, the 3, 3 and 7, 7 should turn up more often, right? However, the complete opposite is true. In fact, 3, 3 and 7, 7 are the least likely to turn up, which is the exact opposite of what it should be. And 9, 1 are actually the most common pair, which is not what it should be at all. Okay, maybe, oh maybe, it's just a base 10 thing, you know. Base 10, you know, who cares about base 10, right? If it was a fundamental property of the primes, then it would happen at any base. And it does. That's what they found. So they checked in other bases and they found that the bias is still there. So it appears to be a fundamental property of the primes. So, for example, if we do it in base 3, it will only end in a 1 or 2, unless it's 3 herself. I can ignore three. You've got two endings. They should turn up about a 
50% of the time each, which is about right. Again, Chebyshev's bias says that just a slight little bias to all the two, but it's tiny. It's pretty much 50-50. It's pretty much a coin toss. In fact, that's what inspired this investigation. The guys who did this investigation were thinking about coin tosses and said, well, primes in base 3 are like a coin toss. Let's see if that's the same thing, because that's a random event. And then they found a completely different thing. This skew that primes don't like to repeat themselves. And that's not what would happen in coin tosses. So if we did it in base 3, there would be four prime endings. Wouldn't you think so? We would have 1-1, one, 2-1-2, one, 2-1-2. Two, one, two, two, one, two, two. Again, they found the same thing. But ones with the repetition are the least likely to occur. We looked at the first million primes. And if you look at the first million primes, then they should all be equally likely to turn up a quarter of the time. 250,000. But no, they didn't get that. So the ones with the repetition were less than 250,000. The ones without the repetition were more than 250,000. So the mathematicians who have been investigating this have tried to come up with an explanation for this. And their explanation relies on a conjecture that goes back a hundred years. It's a conjecture by Hardy and Littlewood. And they had a conjecture about the density of prime numbers. How many primes you can find in patterns. So you can consider all kinds of patterns, like twin primes, that's a pattern, or cousin primes, which have gaps of four. So they had this conjecture about how many of these you should find. And the conjecture has not yet been proven. There's a lot of evidence that supports that it's true. So if you look at the num numerical evidence, it appears to be true, but it hasn't been proven. So the mathematicians looking at this pattern used a modified version of that conjecture. And they came up with a formula that they think might explain this idea. So that formula was the proportion of the following pattern. Let's say you've got rhyme endings A and B. So if you were doing it in base 10, this could be 1137091. One, one, one. So you're looking at the proportion of these endings and they each come up with a formula. The formula was 1 over the number of allowed endings. So this should be like 1 16th from what I've been doing with base 10, right? So when it's equally likely, these are, are the allowed endings. There are 16 of them. The, so the proportion is 1 over the allowed endings multiplied by a thing. What is this thing? That thing depends on if that pattern repeats. If you've got A equals B in that formula. If A equals B, that will affect what thing is. I'll show you what it looks like in base 3. It's kind of okay in base 3. We're looking at proportions of these endings. If they're the same like this, A, A, so in base 3, that would be 1, 1 and 2, 2 endings. The proportion is... If you are doing it when you, they are not equal, so if it was the 1, 2 or 2, 1 endings, the proportion of AB, I'm saying that A is not the same as B. Plus, so the formula they've got is still a conjectured formula because it is based on this hardy little wood formula, which is still a conjectured formula. But it fits the evidence once we start going off to this infinity of this bias becomes less and less important. This is a bias that is hanging around. So in the great infinity of numbers, this bias is evening out. But even up to a trillion, there is still a noticeable bias there. Chapter 10, Wilson Brands. As you know, I love prime numbers. We know there's all different types of primes. We know there's infinitely many primes. And we know there's all different categories of primes. And I'll show you another one. It's called Wilson Primes. There's only three Wilson Primes that we know of. So the three Wilson Primes are five, 
13 and 563. Now actually they think there's infinitely many Wilson primes, but we've only found three of them. So what's this special thing that they do that other prime numbers don't? Well one thing that all prime numbers do is this. You have a prime number P minus 1 and we're going to do a factorial on it. Do you know about factorial? So you're multiplying all the numbers up to and including P minus 1. So it would be 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. So if my prime number is 5, it would be 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. And we're now going to add 1. And this is divisible by the original prime number P. And all primes do that. So in the case of 5, you would have 5 minus 1 factorial plus 1. So what's that? We're talking 4 factorial plus 1. What's 4 factorial? It's 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. And then we add the 1 on. That's 24. So 24 plus 1 is 25. And you can divide that to 5. In fact, you can do that for any prime. That will work for any prime. And it only works for primes. It doesn't work for composite numbers. I've talked about tests for prime numbers before. We've talked about Fermat primes. And sometimes there were liars, weren't there? There were some numbers that weren't prime that passed the test. They were lying to us. This is a 100% test for primes. Only primes pass it, composites fail. Let's have it, let's do a composite. Can I choose one? Oh, you're going to pick a big one, are you? We have to do a factorial, remember, this is the problem. Let's do, um, eight. Right, so eight minus one factorial, and then you add the one. So that's seven factorial plus one. Okay, so we're going to do seven factorial. So that is, hmm, I wonder what that is. 5,040. So 5,040 plus one for 5,041. But I'm saying that's never gonna be divisible by eight. I don't think it's going to be, is it? So we're going to divide him by eight. And he's not. You don't get a full number, a whole number for that. But that's guaranteed. Primes will give you a whole number and composites will never give you a whole number for that. That's called Wilson's Theorem and it's a test for primes. It's not a great test for primes because you have to do a factorial and they get massive. So you'd have to do a massive factorial. If it passes though, it's a prime number. So all prime numbers pass the test. The Wilson primes are special because they pass the test twice over. You can actually do it twice over. You can divide by the prime and then divide by the prime again and you get a whole number. So all prime numbers pass the test once, but only the three that we found managed to do that twice over. I'll show you what I mean. Let's do the five. Well, we did the five already, didn't we? So we got 25. By minus one factorial plus one, so we ended up with 25. So we know you can divide by five. So you know, 25 divided by five is equal to five. And all I'm saying is you can divide by five again. So obviously five divided by five equals one. So that works. Other prime numbers don't do that. So we see a prime number passing it once and then failing the second time. I want to see 13. Let's do 13 first. Let's do it with 13 and see what we get. So we're looking at 12 factorial plus one. And let's see, we got 12 factorial. Brilliant, big number, 479,600 plus one. Right, let's see if the prime number divides it. Do you think it's likely? Yep, it divides perfectly, wonderful. But all primes do that. Does it do it twice? Yes, it does. It does it twice. 
So 13 is a Wilson Prime, as is the last one I found, 563. Do you want to see something fail? This is the check. Pick a prime number. Seven? Yes, that's the seven. Small, isn't it? Right, first I work out how to clear something. Right, so, so we need seven minus one factorial, then we're going to add one. So we're talking six factorial plus one. Well, I know six factorial is 720. If I'm feeling confident, I'm going to say that 721. Let's see if that works. Now if I have the seven, I by seven, which is the prime, works, 103. Can I do it the second time? I don't think it's going to happen though. Divide by seven, again. Ah, uh, no, it's not going to work. So there. So that's kind of nice. It's a nice little prime number fact. There's no great use for it. But why do we have to do everything for application? This is just a great little prime number fact. Now that we know what Wilson primes are, let's have a look of the Wilson lemma. That was just the original result. That was just the one I did before. So I'm saying that prime numbers can do that at least once. Let's just see if that's true. So we're going to prove that. So we're going to, do, to get some more brown paper. Chapter 11, 357 sextillion, 686 quintillion, 312 quadrillion, 646 trillion, 216 billion, 567 million, 629,137 is huge. I'm going to do a show you one in this chapter. I'm going to talk about a special number. I like doing, I like talking about special numbers. I'm going to do a prime. So I'm going to... I love my prime numbers as well. It's quite a big prime number, so I'm going to write it out. 357 sextillion, so it's already going to be big. 686 quintillion, 312 quadrillion, 646 trillion, 216 billion, 567 million 629,137. So that's a massive 24 digit prime number. But this is why it's special. Because if I remove the first digit, the three from that number, the remaining number starting with the five is also a prime number. And if I do that again, if I remove the five, the remaining number starting with the 7 is also a prime number. And that will be true all the way down. So up to here, 629,137 is a prime number. I can remove the digit. The next number will be prime all the way down to 7. So it's always prime when I truncate from the left, so it's called a left truncatable prime, and there are finitely many of them, and that is the largest one. And I learned this from my favourite maths guy, James Prime. James is on a maths channel called Number Fire. Anyway, let's get back to it. In the image in the book, number buddy 26 is holding a pencil with the number written on it. No matter how much he sharpens the pencil, he's always going to have a prime number. Which I think is why he's saying, always in your prime. It's kind of a joke. Kind of a joke. So this is a left truncator of our prime. Let me show you how you can create them. Because they're not that hard to create. So let's start with the um, last digit. So the last digit could be, you know, one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, or nine. My last digit could be any of those numbers, but it has to be prime as well, because I want a prime at the end. So one is not a prime. Two, we could have a prime two at the end, but that's not going to be able to be extended very much. We could have three as a prime number at the end. Four, we're not gonna have at the end. Five could be at the end. Six, no, not a prime. Seven, maybe. Eight, not a prime. A nine is not a prime. So it's going to have to end with one of those numbers. So let's try and extend it back. So we're going to extend it back to the left and make a two digit number. Let's go with seven. 
So let's make a chain. So uh, let's go with the seven. Now, if I extend it, it's going to be either 17 or 27, 37, 47, 57, 67 or 77, 87 or 97. So which of those are prime? 17 is a prime. 27, that's not prime. 37 is prime. 47 is prime. 57 is not. 67 is prime. 77, that's not prime. 87 is not a prime. 97 is a prime. So let me do a couple more steps. Let's go from the 47 and extend that further back. 147 perhaps? Or 247? 347? 447? 547? Six four seven seven four seven eight four seven nine four seven. So let we keep extending this if we want. Let's find a prime on that list. So uh, nine hundred and forty seven, and is a prime. Now let's. I'll go extend that back another step. So this could now be 1947 perhaps, or 2947, 3947, 4947, 5947, 6947, 7947, Eight nine four seven nine nine four seven. So I'm going to extend another step here. I'm going to go from three thousand nine hundred and forty seven. I know that's a prime. So I'm going to go from there and just try to extend it back. So let's do another step. So three thousand nine hundred forty seven could now be. One three nine four seven two three nine four seven three three nine four seven four three nine four seven five three nine four seven six three nine four seven seven three nine four seven Eight three nine four seven nine three nine four seven. Now I'm gonna stop at this step because if I do the checking through, none of these are prime. This one three nine four seven is not a prime, two three nine four seven is not a prime, three three nine four seven not a prime, not a prime. None of these are primes. So the chain stopped. The chain is terminated. So the last prime we had in that chain is 3,947. So that's the end point of the chain that we had. The number of end points that you can make just doing this kind of method, there's 1,142 of these end points. So theirs are going to be the largest prime in the chain. And the largest one of them is the 24 digit number I mentioned before. But clearly you can see that there are only finitely many because once you get to an end point, they can't be extended any further to the left. So that's left truncatable primes. Shall we do right truncatable? Just to show you the largest one that's possible. I'll show you the largest right truncatable prime. So this is just a bit of fun really, so it's a silly thing, I know. However, if I use a different base, because this is a base 10 thing, if I use a different base, base 12 or base 20 or base 100 or something like that, then each step would have longer lists. And if the list is longer, that means they're more likely to hit a prime, so you're going to end up with longer chains. You actually get up, end up with bigger left truncatable primes if you do it in a larger base. For, the, for right truncatable primes, the biggest one we have 
is 73 million nine hundred and thirty nine thousand one hundred and thirty three so that's a prime number and if i start removing digits from the right hand side i always have a prime number if i allowed one to be a prime I could have a larger number. I could have this number. One billion nine hundred and seventy nine million three hundred and thirty nine thousand three hundred and thirty nine. So that's a prime number. And if I remove digits from the right hand side, I always have a prime number. But I end up with one and one isn't a prime number. So I don't know why I've even mentioned it. Let's have a look at left and right truncatable primes. Is there a prime that's on both lists? And yes, there is. The largest one of those that we can find is 739,397. So that's left truncatable and it's right truncatable. So it's on both lists. It's Although, I don't think we can truncate simultaneously, because we're not going to get prime numbers if we do that. What's the longest you can do simultaneously? Well, that's a good question, because what about if we can remove digits in any order I want? 415,673. And I'm going to delete, not just from the ends, I'm going to delete uh, the one. There, he's gone. It's over one. There, he's gone. So now I've got 45,673 and that's a prime number. Now I'm going to delete the three in this case to get 4,567. And if I've got that, I'm now going to delete the 5 in this case to get 467, which is a prime. And now I think I'll delete the 6, eat, eat the 4, so to get 67, which is a prime. And now I'll delete the 6 to get 7. So I create this chain of primes. So, but, but I'm allowed to delete the digits in any way I want. So those are called deletable primes. Now, it is thought of that there are infinitely many of those. But that is something we don't know because we haven't proven that to be true. So that is a challenge. What's the number you could create a deletable prime? Where it doesn't matter what digit you delete, any digit you delete will still leave you with a prime number. Well, that's another good idea. I don't know if they exist. That would be interesting to find out. Conclusion. Now, from past experience, I can imagine some of you might be thinking, what's the point of all of this? Why study these prime numbers and composite numbers of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? and the sliver of Eratosthenes, and the largest prime numbers known to mankind, and why prime numbers are useful when it comes to using the internet, and prime factors, and why one isn't a prime number, and why he's an empty product, and most and primes, and perfect numbers, and the great internet most and prime search, and the last digits of prime numbers, and Chevy Shows bias, and Wilson primes, and factorials, and Wilson's theorem, and truncatable primes, and deletable primes. Well, first of all, I'm not entirely sure there has to be a point. Sometimes things can just be fun. But I think there is a bit of a point. Let me explain. Studying problems like this, things from completely out the left field, make you think differently. Mathematicians come up with new tools and ideas. And thinking differently, thinking about problems you don't normally think about, is really good for your brain. It makes you smarter. And this is where my sponsor, Brilliant, comes in. Brilliant is a website full of puzzles and game and quizzes and courses and all things that come out of left field. They make you think differently. You can't rely 
on the equations or the principles you learned at school. They challenge you and they make you smarter. Now, if you go to brilliant.org slash books, you can check it all out. There's lots of stuff for free, but if you use the slash books URL, A, they'll know you came from here, and B, you can get 20% off their premium service, which unlocks extra goodies on the website. My thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video. By the way, here are some um, facts about round numbers. Here are the top 10. 1. Any number greater than 1 could be classified as either prime or composite. It can never be both. 2. The previous largest prime number was over 22 million digits long. 3. There could be infinitely many Wilson primes, but we've only found three of them so far. One day we could not find a fourth Wilson prime. 4. There are 82 right truncates of our primes. 5. What is the only number in the entire world that has only one factor? He's also the only number to not be prime or composite. Hence, he's unique, just like 2. 6. Two and three are the only prime numbers which are situated right next to each other. Seven. If one was a prime, he would be the only prime, as every number is the, is the multiple of one. Eight. Five is the only number to end in a five. All the others apart from two ending one, three, seven, and nine, as we've noticed. Nine. There are 168 prime numbers from one to a thousand. And ten. Two to the power of 107 minus one is a Merced prime. Da -da 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 Goodbye, see you later. Ta -ta -ta -ta. The end.